Welcome to the Seismic Sisters Show. I'm Kim Christensen, the founder of Seismic Sisters, where we make media with a feminist perspective. In our first show, we pay tribute to Phyllis Lyon, a pioneering lesbian activist who recently passed away at her home in San Francisco at age 95. Phyllis Lyon and her lifelong partner, Del Martin, met in the 1950s, when being a lesbian was dangerous, considered scandalous, and often kept secret. They set out to change all that in their trailblazing work to change culture and shift the politics around LGBT issues. They started out in the 1950s, where they created one of the first lesbian organizations, the Daughters of Belitis. In the 1960s, they published a lesbian magazine called The Ladder, which was circulated around the world. In the 1970s, they wrote the book, Lesbian Woman. And throughout the 80s and 90s, they were involved in key gay rights issues and political struggles. They were also the focus of a documentary film, No Secret Anymore, in 2003, by the director Joan E. Byron. Here for the interview today is San Francisco artist and activist Deborah Walker. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Phyllis Lyon and her partner Del Martin were the first same-sex couple to get married in San Francisco City Hall. The ceremony was performed by then Mayor Gavin Newsom, now California State Governor. Deborah, were you there that day? Do you remember what it was like? Well, you know, it was it was such an amazing morning. A lot of us had been working at the state level to to get the you know the party the Democratic Party to support this kind of action. I went down to City Hall not to get married, but because I just sort of gravitated down there. There was a line snaking around City Hall of people waiting to get married. It was like a veil had lifted. It really was. It was, it's hard to explain that, the, the whole concept of marriage equality. Most people assume that they can have it. Even even a, a relative of mine at one point said, really, you guys can't get married? And so people just didn't think about it. And our community really didn't expect it. And so I think that you create culture and form society of your own within that context. So it was just a surprise and nobody really knew what to expect. But the line snaked not only around City Hall, but all the way through it. It almost felt personal because every person felt it. It was quite amazing. It was, it was so celebratory and uh, truly amazing. Can you tell us about the early days when you first met Phyllis Lyon? What was she like and what were the issues she was working on at the time? The early days, and I'll go back to the 70s, um, as I was coming out of high school, confused in my life, my first introduction to Dell and Phyllis was with their book, this book, there was so little attention paid at the time to lesbian issues or lesbianism, I suppose. There was a lot of talk about gay and homosexual, but oftentimes women were left out of the conversation. So there were a lot of us out there struggling with our sexual identity and um, coming upon a book I know that influenced them, The Well of Loneliness, which is the most depressing book. <laughs> and yet it was a shared experience, which started the process, I think. You know, people uh, realized they weren't alone and those of us out in the community who were able to read and you know get Lesbian Woman, the book that they, they put together talking about their life, it really brought a lot of us out. There's a lot that happens when people are public and come together and are not afraid of being judged by society and they come out at the forefront of these kind of uh, movements. And Dell and Phyllis were that for many of us. I feel like the work they did was like building the ground foundation of a building. You know, you don't see it when it's built, but you can't have a building without it. And they did that. And it's the really hard work because at the time, I mean, they were putting their lives at risk. People were, you know, being attacked for being gay in those days. And it wasn't necessarily that women were totally accepted in the queer community either. It's been a hard process. so. Dell and Phyllis were very well known and revered in the lesbian community. Everybody knew who they were. There's a medical clinic named after them. They, they really inspired a lot of the women in the lesbian community. I would be at events and see them on stage and, and stuff. And I, 
I think it was in the 90s. I was seeing someone, a woman named Margie Adam, who's a singer songwriter and one of the handful of women who started the women's music industry, as it were. And she and, and Phyllis were really good friends, Phyllis and Dell. And folks like Margie, who were so important in the women's movement and the early women's music industry, they were all mentored by these people. And then I've, I've just been at all of these events since then with them. You know, it was a long time of knowing them and being mentored by them as singular lesbians, but also as a couple, because that's really part of the story. We need those models because that's what we haven't had. I moved up here in, to San Francisco in the late 80s and started getting involved doing rallies and whatnot. The Briggs Initiative had happened and they were at the forefront of that. All of these battles that we had around social justice for our community, whether it's marriage equality or the right to serve in the army, um, just essentially being counted all through the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, they were at the forefront because um, our friends were dying. So having them as the spokespeople for our community on so many issues really reinforced a lot of um, the rest of us out there coming out. Deborah, I'd like to ask you, you know that Phyllis Lyon um, was a pioneering lesbian and gay rights activist, but she's not as well known as Harvey Milk or Roma Guy, who was featured in the TV miniseries When We Rise, as well as some documentaries about the AIDS crisis and activism in San Francisco. Why do you think that is? And do you think she should be more famous? Well, absolutely I do. And I'm sure it's going to be happening. They really personally affected so many in our community. And I, I think that that's even before Roma and Dion and the folks who really were at the forefront helping in the AIDS crisis, Dell and Phyllis were, were way back in the 50s. I mean, there was incredible homophobia. And there was also, on top of that, a lot of sexism. Not that there is, <laughs> isn't now, but back then it was really um, accepted. I mean, it was, it was part of what was okay to do. And so as I was able to get their book in the 70s and as the Briggs Initiative came out in 78, I know that they were really active in that where they were trying to say that you couldn't be gay and a teacher because it was too much influence on kids. And that was mainstream at the time. I really like what they did, you know, with We Will Rise, the miniseries, because it's oftentimes so complicated and layered that you can't just capture it in an hour and a half movie or two hour movie. And it does um, lend itself over the decades to that kind of format. And I'm sure there are a lot of stories there, a lot of rich material to mine. Totally. I mean, just from the beginnings of they formed the Daughters of Belitis, um, the Mattachine Society had been around for a while when Phyllis and Dell, you know, got together, you know, there is a, a lack of support in society, at, especially at that point for um, the gay community. And generally it was around bars and social clubs and bathhouses. And that's not how women, um, most women, I'm not going to generalize, but we don't, we, you know, we want to go out and have coffee and meals and more of a sort of social club, which is what they wanted to do with the Daughters of Blightus and figured that using that name, the straight community wouldn't know what we were talking about, but every lesbian would. <laughs> and Deborah, do you know where the Daughters of Blightus, where the name came from? That was the lesbian poetess in the days of Sappho. The focus would be to, to put out information that people you were trying to reach would know what you were talking about. So. It was um, kind of a smart move on their part for their, their forming of this social club. And that's really what it was. It wasn't meant to be political or anything, but it ended up as the front wave of a movement, really. Did they use it as sort of like a salon for artists and intellectuals and activists to gather? And, it, and it, it brought people together because that's the, I mean, culture, as we're seeing now in this age of social distancing, it kind of drives us crazy because humans are by nature wanting to connect and so especially when when you feel like society isn't supporting you and going to a bar is not necessarily what you want to do because you don't 
want to deal with, and, and not even at the time there wasn't even a, a lesbian bar and the gay bars were underground and, and, you know, the men accepted us there, but it was, it was very different. I mean, it was very different back in that time. So, and it was dangerous. So this was a safe place to gather. And yeah, absolutely. We were all women and they were all women. I wasn't around at the time, but that's the whole concept of these kind of things is to really um, create a, a, a salon is a very good definition for it, where people would come and talk about politics and talk about issues and the relationships and be supported. It's really important. I was thinking back to the famous salons of Gertrude Stein and her lifelong partner, Alice B. Toklas, and it seems like there was definitely a connection there being made. In addition, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin started the Alice B. Toklas Democratic Club in San Francisco. Absolutely. And that you worked side by side with them, and you ultimately uh, became active in the Harvey Milk Democratic Club. So they were. There were two clubs in San Francisco. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the politics in San Francisco, we have um, a very active LGBTQ community here, enough so that we have two political clubs. And one is the Alice B. Toklas Democratic Club and one is the Harvey Milk Democratic Club. And, and uh, you know, the argument all the time is who's more progressive. And so um, it gets really heated and the differences are real, even if imagined. <laughs> And um, so I was president of the Milk Club. They started the Alice Club and have been involved in it. Um, at the time I became president, they were, you know, not necessarily in leadership, but they were members and they've always been members. So, um, but it's, it's raucous. I mean, there, there are days, there were elections where, um, because you would go out on the corner and hand out leaflets, especially in the Castro, that's where we, have the most influences in District 8. I can't remember what it was at the time, but um, you'd have to camp out at two in the morning to get the hot corners. <laughs> and there were several times the police were called because it really did get, uh, you know, raucous and emotional. Yes, very fun. I also had read that Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin had their phone number listed like in the public phone book in those days and that they did so intentionally so that young gay people who were you know, coming into San Francisco could have a safe place to land and kind of get oriented. So it sounded like they acted a bit like den mothers uh, in that instance for the community. Do you know anything about that? Well, I know that they did and I, they've always been accessible. I've, I've gone to meet with them several times. I mean, the only requirement is that you can that you could climb up a bunch of stairs of ladders because they lived on the top of a hill in the Castro area. So they were den mothers. They were who leadership in City Hall would go to to talk about how to reach out to the community as we were trying to forward rights for us. But there were so many people that I, I didn't call them personally when I moved here, but many people have told me that story where they were just, they listed their phone number and they were accessible. You know, that's who they are. They, they, made a decision early in their relationship and lives to be there for the community. Um, that's what Daughters of Blight is bringing people together. And people do come to San Francisco to escape from situations that are hurting them emotionally or physically. And um, having that kind of access to people who know where the services are and where there's housing and can help people settle in is really important. What I'm saying is their legacy is really a personal one for many of us in our community. They, they created a, a foundation of coming together in advance of the, the huge need and built people in it, you know, and, and so there's a lot of folks like Cleve Jones and Harvey Milk and Amiano, who have been influenced by them, and probably because of all the arguments and disagreements about policy and, and, and uh, ways forward, but they were in there fighting the battles with all of them. Absolutely. I like the point you're making about how these movements are not just about politics and political activism, but it's about creating new culture, building relationships, and sustaining it throughout the decades to really be effective. One of the things I, I know that 
I've heard them talk about was that, that why they formed the Daughters of Belitis and it didn't just become a chapter of the Mattachine Society is that we focus on different things. I mean, it's why electing women to office is so important because we just come in with a different perspective. And so we prioritize di different things. And, and um, you know, the battle in the, in the, that the Mattachine were dealing with were tea houses and making sure that people weren't being attacked. Serious, serious things. And I'll, I'll point out now that on our board of supervisors in San Francisco or in elected office, I don't think that there's an out lesbian. And that hasn't been the case. I mean, there's been a lot of women leaders and there are um, Actenberg and Leal and Leslie Katz. And, you know, there's a lot of folks who have tried and, you know, sort of not gone beyond that. So what Daughters of Belida started working on was forming relationships and gay marriage and, you know, the things that are important to us. I mean, not that other things aren't, but we do bring our perspective into all of the stuff we do and whether it's cultural, um, whether it's political, they blend so often. They really were at the forefront. We choose love. Thank you to Deborah Walker for being our first interview guest on Seismic Sisters show. Deborah Walker, San Francisco artist and activist. If you'd like more information about Deborah and her art, you can go to www.debrawalker.com. Thank you so much.